Welcome to the uh, APA Institute. Uh, it's a little warm in here. We have the windows open and we're trying to turn the air conditioner on, so hopefully it'll get a little more comfortable. But um, thanks for, for coming out. It's been a really strong response, uh, really to celebrate this amazing publication. I just kind of glanced through it very quickly, and it's really remarkable. Uh, so this is a celebration, but it's also that time of year when, uh, you know, today's Veterans Day, and then Thanksgiving, and then Christmas, and then New Year's, and, you know, for those of us who are not kind of uh, Christian, who are not necessarily um, uh, kind of immersed in, in this kind of culture, Veterans Day for me, for example, is a really very ambivalent uh, experience. I, I cut my teeth uh, at the University of, uh, University of Wisconsin, uh, thinking I was going to go into genetics, and then as the anti-war movement ramped up, I started shifting dramatically because all of a sudden, uh, I was used to being calling, called a chink, but I wasn't used to being, call, being called a gook, right? And all of a sudden, something started happening, and even though I was brought up uh, thinking that, no, oh, we should not buy any Japanese products. My mother had lived through the Japanese invasion of China, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we had big arguments about buying a Panasonic radio, you know. But I all of a sudden realized that uh, I had so much in common with the Japanese Americans whose families had been in the camps. Um, and I started realizing that the exclusion law had happened and all these other things. But it was really the Vietnam War that really um, got me to think far more critically about what racialization uh, in this country has really meant. So these holidays are a tough time. Um, whose point of view are we looking at it from? So I think it's actually especially appropriate that we have this event on Veterans Day uh, to certainly remind ourselves to remember, uh, despite the kind of overwhelming kind of national narrative, which oftentimes can be very uncritical, to be thinking about uh, the larger impacts uh, globally and how racialization has always been a part of the wars in Asia and the Middle East. Uh, so um, so it's, it's, it's something that repeats itself, of course. Um, after 9-11, there's another round of racialization for those who appear to be in the American imaginary, uh, Muslim or Arab. And uh, certainly the great majority of Muslims in the world are actually in Asia. Uh, so these rounds of racialization kind of constantly challenge and uh, open up what it means to be Asian uh, or Pacific uh, in, in this country. And it's a constantly expanding category and constantly changing and morphing category. So it's really, I think, in some ways, really amazing that this volume has come together in a way that um, both challenges what that definition means, opens it up even more, but also uh, looks back at a moment in which uh, so many of the people who are contributors to this were really not necessarily in this country, or the families might not have been in this country, depending on when they came and the ways in which war and refugee status uh, impacted them. Uh, so let me just say a few, express a few thanks. Uh, first of all, uh, I wanted to express our appreciation to the NYU Vietnamese Student Association, uh, who, who's from the Vietnamese Student Association. I just wanted to kind of give you a shout out. So uh, thank you so much for your support. The NYU Creative Writing Program, thank you and also the NYU Bookstore. And we're selling books at a 20% discount uh, just out there at the table. Uh, so thank you very much, and congratulations. So um, my name is Kathy schlen -Files, and um, it is such an honor to be here um, at NYU APA. And thank you so much to Jack. Uh, for really uh, supporting this volume. And I think that, you know, I, I know that Lawrence and I want to really have as much time for the people who contributed to this volume as possible. So I just wanted to give some introductory remarks and Lawrence can back me up or, or smile. Um, we've we've uh, tried can, to coordinate this. Um, but, um, 
One of the, the frames for this volume, Recollecting the Vietnam War, um, actually involves uh, something that Chris Hedges uh, famously wrote about war as a force that you know, brings us meaning. And one of the things uh, for Southeast Asians and the diaspora, it's certainly a force that also brings us into being. And so one of the things that really motivated um, my initial thinking about this volume was the fact that we were looking at a 40th anniversary and much of the discussion that I was having on my campus and you know, kind of with other people involved uh, US veterans and absolutely no discussion involved the refugees, myself included, that were created by this war. So that was actually the very simple uh, impetus behind this collection. Um, we strategically chose to do it as an interdisciplinary collection. And one of the things we really wanted to emphasize was the expansiveness of this conflict. So it's not just limited to Vietnam as a bound site, but also inclusive of the other locations that were part of that conflict. Um, and, but we also wanted to uh, really kind of bring together what we felt, I think, like um, just kind of a, a multiple generations of Southeast Asian American writers and artists um, in, in, to be dialogic. So when you look at the collection, it, we hope that we've curated it accordingly so that the pieces speak to one another. Um, and we chose topics like collateral plus damage to be uh, intentionally quite provocative. Um, my other co-editor, Sylvia Chong, deserves so much credit because um, she did so much in terms of envisioning what this would look like on the page. So, and it's such a shame she's not here. Um, I don't know what to say about that outside of she's not here, but <laughs> but she and I worked very closely with Lawrence, who um, really had the capaciousness to see this volume through. And I just want to turn it to him quickly, and then we'll turn it to the artist. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Jack, and thank you to the Institute. Um, I guess what I would add, it's, it was a wonderful experience working with the contributors to this issue and working with Kathy in particular. Um, one of the things I want to mention um, that might not come up in the course of the evening is we, we devised this in, um, from the beginning as an intervention, not only into public discourse about the legacies of the war, but thinking of it as an educational tool and an opportunity to intervene in classrooms. And so I, I think there's a few folks here tonight, and both Kathy and I have used it in our classrooms. The idea is to, that we wanted this to appear in classrooms, and so it's, been t it's being taught in university classrooms across the country as an opportunity not only to reframe how we think about and remember and learn about the Vietnam War and Southeast Asian diasporic experience, um, but a means to connect classrooms as well. So if you're interested, I would encourage you to take a look not only at the issue, but the teaching program that we've built around it that's online that offer, offers opportunities for students and teachers to connect so that kind of making meaning and making memory of the war is a kind of ongoing process, not only in the hands of artists and writers, um, but in teachers and students. Um, so with that, I'd love to turn it over to some of the issue contributors to read from the issue and talk about their work. Well, I do want to acknowledge the Asian American Literary Review, which is a really great publication and which has really endured. And if you know anything about Asian American literary publications, you know how hard it is to sustain them. So Lawrence and Gerald's work in editing this uh, anthology and, and, and the whole series of issues that they've done is really, really incredible. And um, so my contribution to the, um, the special issue is a piece called On True War Stories, which I'm not going to read, but I'll talk about. And then I'll read a bit from my novel, which relates both to On True War Stories and to the theme of recollecting the Vietnam War. But On True War Stories begins with um, my reaction against uh, Tim O'Brien's piece in The Things They Carried, where he talks about what constitutes a true war story. And you know, it's a very well-known uh, proclamation of the, of the features of the true war story. And what I really thought about when I read that was, well, I, I identify with that because when I was growing up as a, an American boy in the 1970s and 1980s, I loved watching true war stories like Rambo and Apocalypse Now up until that point where they killed the Vietnamese people. And then I thought, wait a minute, um, this is not sustainable because I happen to be Vietnamese. And so the whole idea of the true war story, I wanted to think about through that because obviously we as Americans love our true war stories. It's a staple of American storytelling, still is. But as someone who was growing up as a Vietnamese refugee in a refugee community, what I realized uh, very intuitively 
was that we had many true war stories among Vietnamese refugees. Everybody I knew who was a Vietnamese refugee had a true war story, but it wasn't recognized as a war story by the rest of the United States because oftentimes they weren't about soldiers. They were about people who lost their homes and lost their property and lost their relatives and lost their country and lost their mental health and had to flee to the United States where they were conceived of not as people who had true war stories, but as people who were refugees or who were immigrants. And so what I wanted to do in the piece was to challenge this idea of what constituted a true war story because I think one of the reasons why Americans think of true war stories as stories involving men and soldiers and combat is that allows them to forget that war stories are actually much more pervasive. And the much more problematic kind of war story that we don't like to confront is the, the fact that we're all implicated in the war machine in the United States. We pay our taxes, we vote for certain leaders, we're complicit with the military and foreign policies of this country that involve us in the fact that this entire country is at war, has been at war for at least a decade, has been at war on and off for at least a century. That's the true war story that I wanted to talk about. The military industrial complex that the novelist Gina Apostol calls a psychological complex that we as Americans are addicted to war but we don't want to confront it. And finally, what I talk about in this piece is the fact that maybe it would be really important to recognize the fact that immigrant stories, many immigrant stories, are actually war stories. But we in the United States like to segregate these kinds of, of stories and pretend that immigrants, many immigrants, are not here because of wars or of policies that the United States has carried out over the last century, at least. So. Um, that's one of the reasons why I wrote The Sympathizer, this novel. Um, it's a novel about a communist spy in the South Vietnamese army in April 1975, whose mission it is to flee with the remnants of that army to the United States, where he's going to spy in their efforts to take their country back. So it is a war story. There is a lot of war and combat involved, but it also brings up the stories of refugees and immigrants and uh, is a critique of American culture. Uh, as a military industrial complex. But the section that I'm going to read from you, read to you, uh, is actually about a nightclub and about sexual fantasy. Uh, but as you'll see, it also collect, connects to recollecting the Vietnam War as well. So what happens is that our narrator flees to the United States as a refugee. And if you know anything about Vietnamese refugees, you know that uh, we love to drink and smoke and drink and dance. And so one of the very first things that Vietnamese refugees did in California was to uh, found a nightclub. And this is what this is going to refer to. So our narrator is at a nightclub, and he's going to look at this young woman who he is um, uh, quite infatuated with. <clears throat> now known by just one name, like John, Paul, George, Ringo, and Mary, Lana stepped on stage clad in a red velvet bustier, a leopard print mini skirt, black lace gloves, and thigh high leather boots with stiletto heels. My heart would have paused at the boots, the heels, or the flat smooth slice of her belly, naked in between mini skirt and bustier. But the combination of all three arrested my heart altogether and beat it with the vigor of a Los Angeles police squad. Pouring cognac over my heart freed it, but thus drenched it was easily flambéed by her torch song. She turned on the heat with her first number, the unexpected, I'd love you to want me, which I had heard before sung only by men. I'd love you to want me was the theme song of the bachelors and unhappily married males of my generation, whether in the English original or the equally superb French and Vietnamese renditions. What the song expressed so perfectly from lyric to melody was unrequited love. And we men of the South love nothing more than unrequited love. Cracked hearts are primary weakness after cigarettes, coffee, and cognac. Listening to Lana sing, all I wanted was to immolate myself in a night with her to remember forever and ever. Every man in the room shared my emotion as we watched her do no more than sway at the microphone, her voice enough to move the audience, or rather, to still us. Nobody talked and nobody stirred except to raise a cigarette or a glass. 
and utter concentration not broken for her next, slightly more upbeat number. Bang, bang, my baby shot me down. <laughs> Lana's version of bang, bang layered English with French and Vietnamese. The last line of the French version echoed Fat Zui's Vietnamese version. We will never forget. In the pantheon of classic pop songs from Saigon, this tricolor rendition was one of the most memorable, masterfully weaving together love and violence in the enigmatic story of two lovers who, regardless of having known each other since childhood or because of knowing each other since child childhood, shoot each other down. Bang, bang was the sound of memory's pistol firing into our heads, for we cannot forget love we cannot forget war. We cannot forget lovers. We cannot forget enemies. We cannot forget home. And we cannot forget Saigon. We cannot forget the caramel flavor of iced coffee with coarse sugar. The bowls of noodle soup eaten while squatting on the sidewalk. The strumming of a friend's guitar while we swayed on hammocks under coconut trees. The whisper of a dewy lover saying the most seductive words in our language, I know. The working men who slept in their seclos on the street, kept warm only by the memories of their families. The refugees who slept on every sidewalk of every city. The sweetness and firmness of a mango plucked fresh from its tree. The girls who refused to talk to us and who we only pined for more. The men who had died or disappeared. The streets and homes blown away by bombshells. The streams where we swam, naked and laughing. The secret grove where we spied on the nymphs who bathed and splashed with the innocence of the birds. The shadows cast by candlelight on the walls of wattled huts. The barking of a hungry dog in an abandoned village. The appetizing reek of the fresh durian one wept to eat. The sight and sound of orphans howling by the dead bodies of their mothers and fathers. The stickiness of one's shirt by the afternoon. The stickiness of one's lover by the end of lovemaking. The stickiness of our situations. And while the list could go on and on, the point was simply this. The most important thing we could never forget was that we could never forget. Thank you. Okay, so I, uh, I'm Monique Turing. Hello. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to talk about a project that I worked on, uh, a visual arts project with um, Udam Nguyen, who's based in Ho Chi Minh City. And we did, um, and I'll show it to you. Um, well, first, Let's, let's deal with the, the little introduction. So you can, I'll read it, even though it's up there. And it says, more than my memories define me. The first 10 words that you see are what you desire most in your present, future, and past. All three exist at once, elbowing and bruising each other like siblings. We are not the first to tell you this, are we? If you see more than 10 words, we suggest you forget, simplify, and move on. In fact, you may be suffering from peripheral vision, hindsight, farsightedness, 2020 vision, historical memory, obsession, and nostalgia. Thanks for playing our word search, our typographical Rorschach test, our lo-fi diviner, our cut-rate psychoanalyzer. And there it is. Ah, well, so um, I wrote up some, uh, some explanation, which is probably the last thing you should do for a work of art. But um, OK, well, as some of you know, there's a meme that involves um, a block of text resembling a word search game, and usually there are instructions, like the one that I gave, uh, which usually says something like, the first 10 or, um, words that you see is what you want most, um, or is the most important to you, or is what you need most now. 
So I, I wanted to play with this meme because um, like many Vietnamese and Vietnamese Americans, besides wanting to, or liking to drink and dance and smoke, I also, we also love fortune telling and predictive games. And so I, I like the fact uh, that the person who is sort of the player of this game would be cast as a searcher, first and foremost. And then sort of the, the convention of a word search game is, of course, that it's a block of mostly nonsensical letters, right? All in the same typography and size and scattered hidden within the blocks are words. I wanted instead to present a block that is entirely composed of phrases and words, a block of text that is chock full of meaning, uh, that is meaning rich. And depending on where the searcher's eyes begins to look, depending on where one begins to search, different words and phrases emerge. Now, I wanted to include spe um, specifically Vietnamese as well as English words, and I wanted the Vietnamese words to be without their diacritic marks so that they are uh, more difficult to identify, to read, uh, that they are, you can say, lost within the sea of English. Um, Here are some other thoughts about this. <laughs> uh, history is an inheritance of known facts. In this instance, our meaning-rich block of letters is the stand-in for history, for a set of prescribed terms. Now, we cannot escape history. We can only choose to read it differently. Search it for the lost, the forgotten, the suppressed. History is subjective, thus each searcher will see something different, depending on how their eyes carve that block of text. Um, I also want to say a little bit about Udam's contribution, which is to use color to do the letters in handwritten sort of uh, manner, in varying sizes, with different looks and feel, each on an uh, individual sheet of paper. Some slips, as you may or may not be able to see up there, are a bit wrinkled, their corners are lifted up a bit. Um, to me, it all contributes to um, uh, immediately injecting a human element to this work. Um, I, or, as I like to think about it, um, a human hand in the construction of the work there's, um, to me, also the suggestion of obsessiveness uh, and the worrying of the letters and the slips that they are on, as if each had been moved around quite a bit, shuffled, uh, and that uh, their position in this grid is not permanent and can be shuffled around again at any moment. So um, I also think about his... Udam's use of color, um, colors to me are inherently emotional and soaked, if not saturated, with meaning. Now, who can see the color red without seeing blood? Who among Vietnamese Americans can see yellow and red without seeing the flag, past and present? Um, and so now, I want to close by just showing you the, what I gave Udam. So this is um, just one of the sheets of phrases. And then within the phrase, you can see it harbors all the words underneath. So now th um, this is not part of the journal. Uh, so this is my working document. I thought you would like to see it. So here's the next page. Um, that last phrase on the bottom is, uh, uh, it says, Mung ye nya su, uh, want to go back to the old home, you know. So Mung is want, Mung ye means 
to want to go. Mungye nya, want to go home. Nya is house. Nya su, the old house, or the past. Su is old, past. So here's another page. Well, OK, it's now disappeared. Buy a journal. Take a look <laughs> <laughs> at our contribution, Udam Nguyen's and mine, um, and, and search. Um, the last thing I want to say before I sit down is that I think part of the reason why I wanted to, my contribution to the journal not to be a straightforward piece of prose um, was that, in a way, it was my way of saying, um, the words are there, the history is there, you, you can write it for yourself, you can search it on your own, you don't need me to do it. Um, and this is why this journal is so exciting, because when I first started out, I didn't know I had so many colleagues to come, um, writers and visual artists and poets, and I'm so glad that they're here. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Twi, and I want to start by, of course, thanking Kathy for inviting me um, to be a part of this collection, um, especially because I am neither a writer or an artist. I'm a teacher and sometimes ethnographer. Um, and the piece that I contributed to this uh, collection is really based on some um, research that I've been doing in Vietnam, or had been doing in Vietnam, um, um, looking at the global cosmetics industry. Um, in particularly in Saigon. But as what I realized in writing this piece and, and actually in my sort of research in Vietnam is that um, even as a researcher, my sort of um, confrontation with Vietnam was so informed by my memories or my sort of proxy memories of the place um, through my mother, right? Um, I was actually born in Vietnam, and I came here after the war in 1980 when I was seven, and please don't do the math. Um, and, you know, my family, in my family, my parents were really the only um, among their siblings who left Vietnam, right? So we were very, very much connected to the country always, even before um, normalization. And of course, after normalization, we actually came to visit Vietnam. But it's a very different experience coming there as a researcher. And part of this piece is my thinking about the experience of being someone with this past and also now in the contemporary moment, encountering that place as a researcher. So this piece, um, and Kathy told me just to read the piece, which I'm going to do because I got nothing I have no other art project. I have no novel that was just reviewed by the New York Times. So <laughs> this is it, folks. <laughs> and it's called what, uh, what Not to Wear in Vietnam. <clears throat> in Vietnam now, there are restaurants so nice that they serve you food on real gold plates, my mother told me just before I left on my research trip. She had heard this from my aunt, who was told by a neighbor whose own niece had dined there. The story turned out to be apocryphal, but her wistfulness and but the but the wistfulness and yearning my mother's recounting was very real. In 1986, a decade after the end of the American War, Vietnam began its courtship with the so-called free market by instituting a series of policy changes announced as Dai Mai, or renovation, which opened the country up to an influx of foreign goods and money. By the time I arrived in 2012, the effects of this new socialist market economy were very visible. New restaurants, coffee shops, hotels, boutiques, and malls filled the city center and was transforming its skyline. Resorts by Hyatt, Hilton, and the like elbowed each other for space on the country's coastline. Roadways jammed with taxi-carrying Japanese, Korean, American, Australian, and Thai tourists threatened to crush a sea of mopeds. Not surprisingly, development was in one form or another in everyone's mind. Talk of a new airport, a bullet train from Hanoi, even a subway line, and speculation about new high rises and shopping centers inevitably sprung up in everyday conversation. This was not just chatter among the rich. Many people I encountered had welcomed new restaurants into their neighborhoods, and some had seen changes in their own homes, an additional floor here, an expanded kitchen there. This is the new Vietnam, I was co constantly reminded. 
Those structures left half built by lost, half built by lost investments, dotted city streets, and social conflicts seen in a spate of public demonstrations were becoming widespread. The narrative of progress was rarely, ra rarely went challenged. Talk of building certainly eclipsed any talk of war. For a country whose name had become synonymous with war, there was very little mention of this Vietnamese past. Had the tractors clearing all that land also raised the country's memory? Was it even possible to remember, sitting on the silky sands at the Hyatt Regency Da Nang, that this was the same beach where US Marines first came ashore? I had not come to Vietnam looking for answers to these questions. I came to study its booming cosmetics market and to observe its effect on women's beauty practices. But listening to women talk about beauty, it was impossible to ignore how central the logic of development had become to an understanding of their bodies. A new look for a new time. I often heard my friend Na tell her clients, Nya was an esthetician. She gave facials at a local spa, but her real work, as she saw it, was teaching women how to take care of their bodies, how to become modern. When she instructed women on their skin, she stressed the same principles that city planners had also been pushing on recalcitrant, uh, recalcitrant residents. You want your skin to be sunset depth, she'd say, bright, clean, beautiful. Planners too urged residents, especially those farmers unwilling to vacate desired land, to move for the sake of a new Saigon, one that, be, one that would be clean and organized. Sunset dip, green, clean, beautiful was their slogan, one that was ultimately irresistible. Post Doi Mai, the beautiful city and the beautiful body, both became crucial to Vietnam's practice of liberalization and its assertion of modernity. Beauty became a new border, a dividing line between inside and outside, past and future. Women in particular were encouraged to see beauty as a personal responsibility and a building block of social life. They were encouraged to understand their bodily maintenance as a practice of good citizenship, akin to the maintenance of their homes, streets, and cities. Indeed, women came to see the possibility of their bodily transformation as key to the transformation of their own fates and that of their family and nation. Under this regime, where beauty marks certain bodies and places as potentially more valuable, they understood its pursuit as a rational calculation. Renovation was the right word for this new orientation. The term suggests restoration, or perhaps more appropriately, makeover, a genre very familiar to most Americans. Vietnamese popular culture is less dominated by makeover shows, but Vietnamese women are not unfamiliar with the practice. Bar hostesses and urban elite alike have all had noses, eyes, and chins surgically remade. Schoolgirls and young professionals change their clothes with the trends. They have all learned the magic of a makeover. Perhaps makeover is the best way to think about development in Vietnam, which has not been evenly dispersed or equally enjoyed. Scholars have used the term uneven development to describe this kind of economic, cultural, political, and spatial inequality made visible by the jarring proximity of thatched huts to marble swimming pools. A makeover suggests an even in more intimate relationship, one in which the new sits on top of the old, dental veneers, facelifts, and foundation, which can cover more than they can transform. The cracks of war are still there. There is no longer any sign of the U.S. military camp in Da Nang, or really anywhere in the country. But even the Hyatt can't erase this history. Da Nang was a major storage site for dioxin, a toxic chemical found in Agent Orange, the defoliant the U.S. sprayed on Vietnam, about 20 million gallon in total. Not far from the Hyatt is a dioxin hotspot, cordoned off because of extensive leakage into the ground. Cleanup efforts have been slow, as unexploded, unexploded ordnance has still not been fully cleared. Seepage continues because dioxin is tenacious when it contaminates soil, even soil remade by the glass and steel of a new Vietnam. Nya became an esthetician in this landscape, where toxins seethe under cement, where plumbing fails in forest star estates, where surface sheen only hides sins and sorrows. Like many women of her generation, Na had attended primary school but had little additional education. A friend told her about the certification course. It sounded like, quote, a chance for a new life, she said. Nya told me that over the last decade, she had lost her mother and three brothers to cancer, as well as five first cousins, the slow violence of Agent Orange. She had repeated nightmares about dying herself and was constantly afraid of leaving her two girls without a mother. 
She enrolled in the course hoping not just for a new job, but a whole new life. When we spoke, I heard the same wistfulness and yearning in Yao's voice that was in my mother's. The possibility of eating off gold plates in beautiful restaurants made my, my mother proud of a place she still considered home. She loved all those new buildings. She had no nostalgia for war, which had left her with three young children and a husband in re-education camp. But the new Vietnam hardly contained her ambitions for this place. Like Nha, she was as hopeful for the future as she was worried about it. And like Nha, her past clung to her like a form-fitting dress. And like Nha, she wanted far more than a makeover. Thank you. Can turn the lights. Billahi Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Auzu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. This is for Cambodia, an ancient land of dreamers and builders, sorrow and strength. This is for those who keep our culture alive, for the hidden apsara in all of us, beauty beneath brown flesh, for the fingers arched towards God. This is for all the children of Cambodia, for those who left and for those who never chose the leaving. <coughs> This is for those who are still hunting for home and those who made new homes in far away places. This is for everything that we are and everything that we are becoming. We are the ones who will keep our culture alive. We arrived at the camps with nothing but the clothes on our backs. I remember my five-year-old fingers gripping the back of my father's wet neck, arms locked like strands of rope, a noose at times tightening and loosening to the noises in the jungle, my legs wrapped around his back, bending and branching like fresh jungle twigs. He told me it was a game, and at times we'd have to run, sometimes running so fast my legs swung loosely, knees, knees beating against his back, and how he sweated all those miles away, shirt soaked in trembling heartbeat. Even the thick foliage couldn't guard us from the scent of fear that loitered around us, couldn't shield us from the torch in the sky that followed us everywhere until the, until the moon swallowed us into the night. We couldn't silence the way the darkness teased us with the imagined limbs of lost children, the illusions cracking as we stepped on brittle branches. There was no time for hesitations, only slivers of moments when we waited for the night to slip faster into the day. And how my father's feet screamed a silent din which never quite rose above that jungle canopy, his legs like iron pegs burning at the stump with each step, walking, running, always running, and how he heaved me on his back all those miles, make believing it was just another father-daughter game, a piggyback ride, he told me. A long piggyback ride, he whispered. The last piggyback ride, he said. And when it was over, he promised me we'd never have to run again. Thirty years later, I will return to a country I have never known that burns a hole inside my heart the size of home. 
when I arrive, will I recognize loss? If she came to greet me at the airport, will she help me with my bags, usher me through customs? Will she take me to my birth village, point me to the graves of ancestors? Will she share her silence with me? Will she embrace me? Will I ask these same questions? Or will I be asked to prove my belonging? Do I begin by pulling out the remnants of a broken tongue, hunt for similarities in a sea of strangers, spot the same cheekbones on a little girl as she smiles, selling trinkets, find a boy with that thick, unmanageable wave of hair that kinks near his ears, close in on an old man with a nose broad and brown and rounded, soft, catch a familiar scowl from an ashy-haired woman who sees me first, or will I need to look even deeper? Scan for eyes gouged with the same obsidian tint of regret as mine. Consider textures on dry flesh that easily flinches in a forest of touch. Watch for veins beneath wrists that have stared down the teeth of razors. Trace cracked lines on open callous palms. Do I stitch a patchwork of borrowed resemblances to justify my birthright? Or will I be at a loss for words? I wonder once I have visited loss. Will she stamp my exit visa? I often think about her leaving and all we left behind. Imagined our lives without this exodus, dreamt of days when I could speak to loss, to tell her we didn't choose to leave. The leaving chose us. The leaving chose us. Inna lillahi wa inna ilaihi rajiun. Inna lillahi wa inna ilaihi rajiun. Inna lillahi wa inna those are just excerpts from the piece that's in the book, which is part of a larger one-woman show. And <laughs> I have the piece usually memorized, but I was trying to stick to the text, so I started stumbling a little bit because the performative version of that is a bit different than the one that's on the page. These are the only images that remain from my childhood. They are four images um, in the refugee camp in 1979. And that is the camp that um, uh, hundreds of thousands of Cambodians walked to uh, from uh, the nearby cities, especially from Battambang, where my family is from. And this was a camp in Thailand. It is not Kawi Dung. It is uh, one that is near there, and we were one of the first um, a few thousands of people that came to the camp. Uh, and these, these are my childhood photos. Uh, I made it into this multimedia piece that is part of the one woman show called Living Memory, Living Absence. Um, it's one of my early collaborations with my um, partner, husband. Masahiro Sugano, who did the animation of the barbed wires. Uh, for me, that's me, next to the care package um, near my grandmother. And you'll see it's uh, kind of reposition, similar to uh, a, a target. And uh, yeah, I mean, we, these, it's, I don't know, I, th I think about this period a lot because um, I was five years old when we left when we were forced to leave Cambodia, when the leaving chose us. And I would not return there for the first time until I was 30 years old. So that would be you know, 25 years later for the first time. And then I would actually get the chance to live there finally, which was a really um, ache of mine. 
uh, when I was awarded the U.S. Fulbright Fellowship to do um, some research there. And it's really interesting because, you know, I was supposed to stay for 10 months, but um, it ended up being almost five years, um, which is a really magical number because, you know, I lost, I feel like I lost those memories as a childhood because of whatever trauma that happened during those years. So instead, you know, I revisited that time in Cambodia and spent five years as an adult raising my own child who then has five years of her life and um, her memories. So I find that really poetic and um, a kind of poetic justice. So I'll leave you with that. Hello, everyone. My name is Ocean Vuong. Um, thank you to the uh, editors and to my fellow artists and uh, historians um, for putting this together. And thank you all uh, for your presence. I'll be reading uh, three poems. Um, during the fall of Saigon in 1975, the uh, American uh, radio station played a coded message for American personnel. And uh, a song was played was Irving Berlin's White Christmas. And um, I, this poem is a meditation on the fall with the lyrics uh, threaded through. Obad with burning city. Milk flower petals in the street, like pieces of a girl's dress. May your days be merry and bright. He fills a teacup with champagne, brings it to her lips. Open, he says. She opens. Outside, a soldier spits out his cigarette as footsteps fill the square like stones fallen from the sky. May all your Christmases be white as the traffic guard unstraps his holster, his fingers running the hem of her white dress, a single candle, their shadows, two wicks, a military truck speeds through the intersection, children shrieking inside a bicycle hurled through a store window. When the dust rises, a black dog lies panting in the road, its hind legs crushed into the shine of a white Christmas on the bedstand, a sprig of magnolia expands like a secret heard for the first time. The treetops glisten and children listen. The chief of police face down in a pool of Coca-Cola, a palm-sized photo of his father soaking beside his left ear. The song moving through the city like a widow, a white a white, I'm dreaming of a curtain of snow falling from her shoulders, snow scraping against the window, snow shredded with gunfire, red sky, snow on the tanks rolling over the city walls, a helicopter lifting the living just out of reach, the city so white it is ready for ink. The radio saying, run, run, run. Milk flower petals on a black dog, like pieces of a girl's dress. May your days be merry and bright. She is saying something neither of them can hear. The hotel rocks beneath them, the bed a field of ice. Don't worry, he says, as the first shell flashes their faces. My brothers have won the war, and tomorrow the lights go out. I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming to hear sleigh bells in the snow. 
in the square below. A nun on fire runs silently towards her God. Open, he says. She opens. Um, I, uh, I came to America. I was born in, uh, in a rural village outside of Saigon. And I came to America uh, via uh, a refugee camp in the Philippines. And my family are essentially rice farmers. So they have been illiterate for centuries, but they have not been empty uh, of, so of songs and stories. And so they've always told me stories and made up their own field songs and poems. And um, as a poet, I, tr I attempt to imagine what they would say or what they would write, have, them, have they been able to write. Um, so this is a poem in the uh, voice of my mother. It starts with an epigraph of um, a Vietnamese proverb. And it says, Không có gì bằng cơm với cá. Không có gì bằng má với con. Which uh, roughly translates to, there's nothing like fish and rice as there is nothing like mother and son. It's our version of two peas in a pod. <laughs> Head first. Don't you know? A mother's love neglects pride the way fire neglects the cries of what it burns. My son, Gong Ai, even tomorrow you will have today. Don't you know there are men who touch breasts as they would the tops of skulls, men who carry dreams over mountains, the dead on their backs. But only a mother can walk with the weight of a second beating heart. Stupid boy, you can get lost in every book but you'll never forget yourself the way God forgets his hands. When they ask you where you're from, tell them your name was fleshed from the toothless mouth of a war woman, that you were not born, but crawled head first head first into the hunger of dogs. My son, tell them the body is a blade that sharpens by cutting. And uh, lastly, um, I, I, I don't often write about the war in Vietnam, but I, but I write with the faith that regardless of what my subject is, the war and its history will be a part of me, as it is a part of my flesh. Um, even if I were to write about Mars, I think Vietnam will, will come out in its own way. And um, so this poem borrows a phrase from a New York poet named Frank O'Hara, in which he says, um, in one of his lines, he says, someday, I'll love Frank O'Hara. I thought such a wonderful uh, and, and uh, tender thing to say to yourself. So I wrote this poem. <laughs> I wrote this poem to myself titled, Someday I'll Love Ocean Ball. <laughs> Ocean, don't be afraid. The end of the road is so far ahead. It is already behind us. Don't worry. Your father 
is only your father until one of you forgets. Like how the spine won't remember its wings, no matter how many times our knees kiss the pavement. Ocean, are you listening? The most beautiful part of your body is wherever your mother's shadow falls. Here's the house with childhood whittled down to a single red tripwire. Don't worry, just call it horizon and you'll never reach it. Here's today, jump. I promise it's not a lifeboat. Here's the man whose arms are wide enough to gather your leaving. And here the moment, just after the lights go out, when you can still see the faint torch between his legs, how you use it again and again to find your own hands. You asked for a second chance and are given a mouth to empty out of. Don't be afraid. The gunfire is only the sound of people trying to live a little longer and failing. Ocean, ocean, get up. The most beautiful part of your body is where it's headed. And remember, loneliness is still time spent with the world. Here's the room with everyone in it. Your dead friends passing through you like wind through a wind chime. Here's the desk with the gimp leg and a brick to make it last. Yes, here's a room so warm and blood close. I swear you will wake and mistake these walls for skin. Thank you. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that all of these um, works are from the 1.5 generation. And I'm wondering if you guys can speak about like the differences between um, the first generation 1.5 and 2, and uh, what would we see in the differences? I mean, I, I can kind of stepping back, and I mean, I'd love to hear from folks, uh, contributors on the panel, um, but stepping back from an editorial perspective, it was really important to have a range. And so the collection does have um, work by 1.5. Um, it has by art, visual art and writing by folks living, like uh, Monique Workud Udam, who's in Ho Saigon, or in Ho Chi Minh City, folks living and working in, um, in Cambodia, in Laos. Um, so it was, it was important kind of have a geographic range, to have generational range, to have second generation, to have 1.5, to have um, uh, a kind of spectrum of response. Um, but in terms of like your question about specific folks thinking about how that response kind of modulates for them personally, um, I'll leave that to, to contributors. Well, um, <clears throat> I identify as a 1.5-ver, 1.5-ver, and um, a lot of my work deals with that, and I also work with um, community of deportees in Cambodia um, that are also 1.5-ers who have had the unfortunate predicament of being deported from the U.S. to Cambodia, a place that they had never been because most of them were born in refugee camps. So it's a very complicated identity and I think um, thematically what 
is perhaps important to consider is that I feel that for 1.5ers, the memory and the trauma is embodied. It's, it's still in us. Like the, it's, it's in my body because I was born there and I went through the genocide even if I can't remember it. So the residue, the residual effects and that stain of the trauma is something that is carried with me and um, uh, is constant. And then there is the issue of returning. Um, when you return as um, one of the diaspora to a place that's supposed to be your home and your motherland and all the complexities that come around that, you're, you have this um, constant insider, outsider fluctuation, and that's constant. And you go in and out of it, depending on the moment. If I could just um, can add to that. Um, and, and this project, in some ways, came out of research that I had done on 1.5 generation Cambodian American artists, um, you know, as we know. Um, and one of the things that was quite striking to me is um, I began that project thinking that 1.5 generation subjects were able to break silences, right? So it was very difficult uh, for first generation or like the parents of 1.5 generation uh, subjects to really narrate that trauma for a variety of reasons. And I think that that's something that really resonates um, you know, in the work that was presented. What was really quite striking is like how intimate and how uh, focused on family this was, right? Um, but I also think that in terms of 1.5 generation, this is just, you know, uh, because of the circumstance of who could come here, you know, uh, today. Because if you actually look at the collection, there's first generation, 1.5, second generation, diasporic artists, people who are living in Southeast Asia, people who are kind of living in other locations outside of the United States, such as France and Australia. But I, but I do think that you're, you're, you're hitting on something that was like kind of curated for the purpose of the panel. Hi, thank you so much for your art and your readings. I really appreciate this a lot. Um, I have a question for Anita, and maybe some of you can also jump in too. But I'm really interested in the relationship between Vietnam and Cambodia, and uh, especially after uh, the Vietnam War, how either country uh, recollects this inheritance. Um, and I was wondering how Cambodians in Cambodia, um, since you've been living there in the past recent, recently, um, I was wondering how they reflect on this war, or even if there are some who don't even acknowledge, you know, the histories that connect them? Okay, that's a very loaded question. Um, have you been to Cambodia? Yeah. When did you go? I went in 2010, 2012, but I wasn't able to, you know, research and kind of connect with communities during those times. Yeah, I mean, I, the history, especially with um, the Khmer Rouge related history is not really taught in the curriculum and in the schools and that's actually a recent development as a result of the ACCC, the tribunals um, that happened with um, lots of money. Um, it's, it's complicated because people know about it because their grandmothers talk about it and their parents mention it. But the newer generation of people don't want to be known for it and don't want to be trapped by it. And they're also a generation that um, are so far removed from, from the trauma and also because there's not a collective healing that happened or a reconciliation that happened and so I feel that you know the trauma is just present and non-present I don't know how else to say it um, and it, it's complicated because of globalization and the global imagination and perception of Cambodia um, while people inside Cambodia are resisting that um, 
narrative of trauma and, you know, it's either traumas or temples, you know. Um, so there's a resistance to that as well. So, yeah, I think that's all I can say about it. It's complicated and you don't need to go back and like research it, you know. You can go back and just talk to folks. Like that's the research. You talk to your family members that are here. That's the research. And then, you know, you carry that knowledge with you and you go back and you talk to folks that are connected to you. You just talk to the tuk-tuk driver, the motodok people, you know, that's, that's where the stories are. Like that's where, uh, at least to me, that's that, that the everyday lives of people, which is something that is persistent in my work, um, that's what is of interest to me. Um, it's, it's not what's, you know, supposed to be captured in the history books, which people have very few of. I mean, again, as a result of the ECC and the Documentation Center of Cambodia has um, a textbook that's being distributed for free, but again, it's not mass produced enough to give to everybody, but it's, it's a starting point. You know, we, we uh, <clears throat> think of this war as the uh, Vietnam War here, and if you go to Vietnam, they call it the American War, and liberal Americans like to say, yes, we should call it the American War because we're responsible for that, but both of those terms are actually really inaccurate because they allow <clears throat> both Americans and Vietnamese to pretend to, or to forget that the war happened in Cambodia too. And obviously that allows Americans off the hook for having to remember you know, that Americans bombed this country tremendously. But it, you know, it also allows Vietnamese people to forget that the war was not simply a war of resistance against American aggression, but it was a war of Vietnamese aggression against other countries, Laos and Cambodia. And that is something that's really crucial to remember that the Vietnamese don't want to remember. And obviously the, United, the Vietnamese also invaded Cambodia for a few years after the war, in the second Indochina War. That's something the Vietnamese don't want to remember either. So if you go to Vietnam, there are all kinds of monuments, memorials, and museums to the heroic resistance against the Americans. And I can't think of anything about the Vietnamese in Cambodia. So it just goes to show that uh, the Vietnamese, just like the Americans, are just as capable of remembering and forgetting according to their own agendas. But also, you know, Cambodians um, don't like Vietnamese people either. So there's still quite a bit of you know, uh, racism that goes both ways around that border. Um, and the last thing that I'll say is that um, th there was mention of the EC uh, ECCC, the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia. Um, and right now, that tribunal is uh, hearing arguments for the first charges of genocide to ever be you know, kind of promulgated in this tribunal. And genocide vis-a-vis -vis the Cambodian case is a bit vexed because many um, historians previously characterized it as an auto-genocide, right? Because it was uh, allegedly a class-based genocide. And the crux of the genocide case right now for case 002-02 uh, pivots on the uh, extermination of Vietnamese Cambodians, right, or those living in borderland areas. So, you know, this, you know, this creates even a, a greater complication with regard to genocide politics in country. Um, I guess I just want to say thank you to all the contributing writers for being able to be here at the panelists. Um, and so my question is for the contributing writers, what kind of advice would you have for aspiring, you know, Asian American writers? Um, you know, having with a, a first generation parents pushing us toward, you know, being successful in medicine and everything else, and then for their, you know, children to go towards writing, what is your advice for them, I guess? Listen to your parents. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to answer this one. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, you know, I, I went to law school um, and I practiced law in New York for three and a half years before I became so miserable and suicidal that I became a writer. And, and <laughs> really, you, you know how bad it must have been, right? <laughs> but so I, I want you to know this, that I went to law school because my parents were terrified of the fact that I would have an unstable future. This is why they thought 
we came here. And yes, that is, I understand that. But I think ultimately what I was able finally to communicate to them was that we came here also for the simple <laughs> desire to live as human beings. And part of that is happiness. <laughs> and if you can be happy as a doctor, yay. If you can be happy as a lawyer, great. But some of us can be close to happy <laughs> by pursuing creative endeavors. And if this is really, it requires you to sit with your parents and explain to them really what is at the core of you. And it's not just them imposing you know, their desires or their, their fears. You have to meet that and you have to explain what it's like for you in this world and what will allow you to continue on as a human being in the pursuit of happiness. Simple response, but really, that's all I could ever say to you know, immigrant and refugee um, artists, aspiring artists, aspiring writers. Uh, well, I'm, I think maybe I'm a bad example because mm, my family, when they got to America, um, they were never um, part of uh, the city structure in, in Saigon, and so they never dreamed of it. In fact, there was a lot of suspicion with being a city slicker, right? Um, and um, so when they arrived here, going through so much trauma, their, their farm was napalmed, and so they fled to, eventually they fled to Saigon. And, um, and so their life in America is often actually quite precarious, and they, you know they're all in debt, and they spend all their money. It's like there's a word, there's a phrase that my grandma likes to say: "It's salang sang which is spend all your money, party all night, and go home early in the morning. And that's kind of how they treated their life in America. They said every day was not promised to them in Vietnam, and so when they got here. They act. They did. You know what Monique said was so touching because my family was kind of like that. Was there? It's like as long as you're happy, do it. And they saw everything as a bonus. Everything as a, you know. They said just go, just do high school, and then work in nail salon like us. You know, <laughs> and I thought nail salon was pretty good because uh, when I was little, I would uh, do the phones uh, appointments for them, and I said, "What? Wow, you can work and watch Oprah." <laughs> and you know where where in the world can you can you work like that? So I was set. <laughs> I, w I thought it was the greatest job, um, and so I kind of stumbled into literature, and they supported it because for them they didn't read it. Um, so to them it was sort of like a mystical thing, right? Um, I would sit at the kitchen table and read, you know, the local newspaper or some rag and and. Uh, my mother and my family would say, oh, everyone, ocean's reading, everyone clear out. <laughs> and, and they didn't understand, and, and they'll say, say, why are you, don't they just look like dead ants? You know, and the words, you know, and, and so uh, I was just sort of uh, encouraged to do whatever, and that was a, a great blessing, because they did feel that sense that I think Mo, you know, Monique is talking about. When they get here, um, it's, we shouldn't be here. We almost couldn't have, couldn't have made it. Um, so as long as you can have joy because it's been so rare, you don't question or meditate on that possibility. You just live it as fully as you can. And um, I think ultimately the immigrant story of, of Vietnamese and American, whatever generation it is, is one of an insistence and a preservation of joy. Hi, I, I just have a comment. I just took a chance to come. It's been very interesting. Um, and I was just, as I, as I was cl closed my eyes to listen to a lot of the, the stories and poems, you know, I, I began to see um, 
in a small way, parallels of, um, I guess, uh, some of my own ancestors who came from the Caribbean and um, the invasion in uh, Puerto Rico in 1898, and just some of the things that um, some of my family had told me about, you know, after coming here in, uh, I guess, the 50s, and what that was like, just being new and having to work hard and stuff. Um, what are some of the parallels that, that you see of other peoples who've come from war situations or just other situations? What, do you, what parallels and relationships do you see? Thank you. So you're going to give the hardest question to me. <laughs> you know, if, I, I mean, I think, I think it started us off thinking about the parallels, right? About the story of, of the immigrant or the refugee is not the story only of Vietnamese-ness, or, uh, right? That, that there are many different immigrants and many different refugees, right? And that in some ways there is a kind of collective experience, right? Um, you know, that there's, there, there are these stories that, you know, when you start to hear from different communities, they start to sound very similar, right? Not in the details, not in the specifics, right? But maybe in the feeling, right? Uh, maybe in the sensibility, maybe in the imagery, right? That you actually start to see a lot of these patterns. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have much more to say than that, right? But I think that one of the interesting things for me um, you know, I don't, I don't really consider myself a Vietnam scholar or a Vietnamese studies scholar, right? Um, you know, but I carry some of this with me as I do all kinds of work, right? And I think one of the interesting things for me is that um, there's, there's always a kind of tension between thinking about this experience, right, and the kind of iconicity of the Vietnam War, right? So the Vietnam War becomes this kind of metaphor for all sort of protracted engagements, right? You know, the joke is, like, don't get yourself in a land war in Southeast Asia, right? Or, like, you know, Afghanistan is the new Vietnam, or Iraq is the new Vietnam. It becomes this kind of recurring motif, right? And it has a kind of iconicity to it, right? But actually, you know, when we start to think about the relationship between this and, say, um, the Filipino-American War, right? Um, we actually see very, like, a, a long historical continuity, right? And we start to see a kind of global continuity when we start to make the comparisons and to make the connecting, the connections. And to me, you know, um, when I start to think about these kind of historical and global patterns, um, it's really impossible to think of this as unique. Right. Well, okay, so Monique wanted me to talk about the um, Vietnamese-American response to the Syrian refugee crisis. And it's one of the, it's one response to the, the question that was asked, which is, for, for some, you know, I, mean, I think when the Syrian refugee crisis happened, it's still happening now, many of us felt that we could see our own experiences in what was taking place. And that it was necessary for us to speak out and to make those connections explicit that what happened to us as refugees and turned some of us into boat people and some of us into land refugees and so on was uh, something that the United States was willing to address because it had no choice. Everybody knew the U.S. was responsible for, for what had happened and the U.S. was forced to take some kind of action. But with the Syrian refugee crisis, there was this obviously distinct sense that uh, most people didn't feel that the U.S. had anything to do with this, therefore the U.S. didn't need to respond. And so it was necessary for Vietnamese Americans who are refugees to step forth and say, no, we actually see a similarity here between what happened to us, what happens, what's happening to these other people, and that it's our obligation as Americans, but also as people who benefited from these American policies to force or to encourage Americans and others to see the similarities between these kinds of situations. So that's not, but not all Vietnamese people feel that way. I, mean, I know there's some Vietnamese people who say, we're, 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 we're different refugees, we're better refugees. These Syrians are Muslims. We're not, we're not like that. So it's, it's, it's a divided community, uh, but it's, it's necessary for, for those of us who see these connections to make those connections because we benefit from those uh, uh, feelings and sentiments ourselves. So, <laughs> We're living in the country that did this to Vietnam um, in a lot of different ways. And not only that, but um, the, you know, Americans themselves have a very distorted view of what happened in Vietnam to this day. Vietnam is a big part of, of discourse about foreign policy, and yet most Americans have very little idea what happened. Do you guys 
of the contributing writers among you, do you, do you see your work as, as challenging the dominant narrative in America about what happened in Vietnam, or do you see your work as something separate, something that is kind of complementing that or, or um, intervening in a different way? Well, I mean, a lot of people have told, told me, Americans who are not Vietnamese, have told me, oh, I, we didn't know anything about Vietnamese refugees, or we didn't know about this aspect of the Vietnam War, and you know, the perspective that you bring, that is me, to this is something that Americans haven't seen before, and that was certainly something that I wanted to do. But um, what, what I don't want to do with this book, and in response to your question, is to, to reaffirm the sense that it was only Americans who did this to the Vietnamese people, because that contributes to this sense of guilt that Americans have, and it contributes to this, this whole issue that the, the Vietnamese in Vietnam would certainly want Americans to keep on feeling guilty because it deflects any guilt that the Vietnamese people might have. And part of the point of the novel and part of the, what I really believe is that, yes, the Americans and the French and the Chinese and the Soviets all did stuff to the Vietnamese people and the Chinese. You can't forget the Chinese. <laughs> but, but ultimately, the Vietnamese people did it to themselves too. And that is a sort of a, a, a moral, ethical, political, problem that Vietnamese people have a really hard time confronting or acknowledging. And it's, it's absolutely necessary for artists, just to speak about this one community, to, to, to be able to foreground that. Because, and I don't know what the, the, the rest of the panelists' experiences are, but when I go back to Vietnam, uh, the, the, the discourse is not like, oh, the Americans did this to us. The discourse is, oh, you, you overseas Vietnamese person, give me some money. Because, you know, we're all part of this history and we're bound it together. And that's, that's one aspect of how it is that for Vietnamese people, this is really our history, not necessarily just the history of what Americans did to us. For me, I would say that there was a, um, there was a, a decision that I made with my first novel to set it in Paris in the 1920s and the 1930s with a Vietnamese character there. It was one way to remind Americans that Vietnamese people existed prior to their involvement in our country. So, and that the French were way ahead <laughs> in terms of oppression and, <laughs> um, and the desire to rule us. So, and before that, of course, the Chinese and so on. So it was, you know, I, so that decision was very purposeful. You know, it, it was really, uh, intentional that I that uh, it was in a novel my first novel in Paris you know that was set in Paris so that was one way that I, I tried to sort of uh, expand the discussion uh, of uh, what it means to be or what the history of Vietnam yeah yeah I'll just add that um, <clears throat> you know, by, by way of a kind of a sideway answer, you know, when I was in Vietnam during my research, you know, I'm kind of approaching it thinking like, you know, that, that there is this kind of shadow cast by America on Vietnam, right? And, you know, uh, following with Ani what Anita was saying, you know, you start to talk to all these people and no one's talking about America. No one's talking about the US or they're talking in very sort of distant and kind of, you know, abstract ways about it, right? They're really concerned about, the, you know, Chinese trying to claim land on the South China Sea, right? They're really concerned about Korean cultural imperialism and Korean economic development in in contemporary Vietnam, they're really concerned about what is happening in the region, right? And to me, that was very sort of revealing in the ways in which, you know, we ourselves have an investment in thinking of this is a story about Vietnam's relation to the United States and will always be that story. And in the contemporary moment, it really is not the story. I, I just wanted to quickly throw out, if I may, um, as, as Monique was talking about her work and, and Viet was talking about his novel, they're not only providing a kind of alternate or counter history, but I think in the kind of the, the work of Gertrude Stein that she's taking up and then in Viet, the, the, the kind of the Hamlet, the apocalypse now, is like pointing to the how, the very fact of what you're asking. It's like how representation and the grand narratives have been controlled by American media forms. And one of, the, one of the things we're trying to do in the collection, overtly, we have a whole section devoted to thinking about Vietnam War film as a genre and as a control of the, of, of the narrative and trying to subvert that actively and like work 
through and around? And what are the stories behind that? Or what does that include? And how can we think uh, how those have operated? Um, I just want to say that um, I, I hold America accountable for a lot of the issues that um, have to do with the fallout of what's happened, especially with the deportations of Cambodian Americans. And that has everything to do with U.S. Um, geopolitics and the, the bombing and destabilization of Cambodia, which led way to, for the Khmer Rouge to really take power, which led to the genocide and the refugee situation in which the U.S. opened doors to these very refugees that they brought, but they didn't have a plan in place, so they put them in the inner cities where they faced more violence, um, racial issues, poverty, you know, the economic violence, um, and so many of these young men and women went into, um, you know, gang life and um, committed crimes, and as a result of many things, uh, immigration laws, the, the Patriot Act, the War on Terror, all of these really heavy things that are related to the U U.S. policies that don't consider um, like the real follow through on, on accepting refugees, right? So, I mean, all this is to say that there are some really um, disturbing policies that continue to affect people of my generation that have been unfairly um, deported from the U.S. and have to live their lives in exile away from the culture that they know and the families that they have come up upon and the communities that they have existed all their lives in before being put in jail and then um, you know, deported. Uh, hi, my family's from El Salvador and in interviewing uh, ex-guerrilla fighters, I found that a lot of them went to train in Vietnam before going back to resist in El Salvador. And uh, in my community, there's a lot of pride that these peasants and students were able to organize and resist the, super, the superpower and bring them to the negotiating table. Uh, I wonder, uh, so when I go to write, I have an interesting relationship when I'm trying to depict violence, uh, resistance, violent resistance. And I'm wondering what kind, of, what kind of feelings do you have, what kind of things complicate when you try to engage with the violent resistance of the Viet Cong in your writings? Well, well I mean, part of the first, in response to the first part of your question about, about uh, Salvadorans who were inspired by the Viet Cong, that was part of the history, right? That the, for a while, the Vietnamese Revolution was seen as a, 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 a noble thing. And uh, it's sort of, sort of sad that, that in the 20 or 30 years after the triumph of that revolution, the Vietnamese revolutionaries really squandered that goodwill and simply became another state that oppressed its people, right? But in the, the question of depiction of violence is really um, a hard one because, you know, you know, in my case, my book has a lot of violence, you know, a lot of violence. And a lot of violence, you know? And I was, I was troubled by that because how do you ethically depict this without enjoying it? Um, because, you know, again, referring to American movies of the Vietnam War, a lot of it is very violent, but you get the sense that you're, that you're supposed to enjoy watching these people get killed and everything like that. Uh, so the way that I sort of dealt with that is to acknowledge that this, this kind of violence is happening, that there can actually be pleasure undertaken in, in doing the violence or in watching the violence or reading about the violence. But also, um, you know, to give away something about what happens in the book, I subject my own narrator to a lot of violence so that he himself is, is, is held responsible for some of the forced forces that he unleashes. And the book is also very self-conscious about what it means to talk about violence. So there's quite a bit of discussion about, you know, why are we watching this movie? Why are we, what does it mean to, to look at representations of violence? So I think that's also one way to deal with it too, is to, to be aware in, if you're writing about violence or torture or trauma, to be aware of what it means to, to write or about that or to depict that and try to figure out, you know, as an artist, how you're going to signal to the reader that you're not simply doing it for the sake of doing it, right? That's not a, that's not a great response, but that's the best I got. Okay, um, I don't write about um, 
violence in terms of war in my uh, work. And I'll tell you why. And I say this from just a very personal point of view. It's not to discourage you from um, approaching it as a writer. To me, war is the end of creativity. War is the end of human imagination. It's, it's when there's nothing left. And as I say that, what I, of course, acknowledge is that the aftermath of war is where art exists again, where creativity and imagination begins again. And that's when, if you apply that to violence, I would say it's the survival of violence um, that interests me personally. And I say this, and I can see your face as you know, sort of shaking like, hey lady, that's not how I'm gonna do it. But good, I'm glad because there should be multiple voices, multiple approaches. And this is why, personally, I mean, I'm, I mentioned it when I was standing up there, I'm so glad that Viet's book is out there, that he and so many other Vietnamese American novelists are out there now because they have a different point of view. And so I don't have to be the, the point of view. So for your, I hope there's a lot of El Salvadorian Americans out there writing as well so that you won't have to be the point of view either. So good luck. I, I, I think of that question a lot because there's so much ethical weight that has to be put on the gaze. Um, when I first started writing, I, I didn't know Vietnam was a subject that I could even write about. You, know, did, you enter the tradition of the poetics and all you have is old white men named Robert getting lost in the woods. <laughs> and so I thought, in order to have a seat at the table, you had to enter it through there. Um, and so through my self-education of the Vietnam, uh, Vietnam's history, even before the Vietnam War, I realized that violence is part of our human history. And I didn't want to deny myself um, that gaze. And it also ha sort of deals with, um, has to do with ideas of beauty. I think I'm very wary of um, making violence beautiful. Um, and I think I echo what Monique says, where it is not necessarily the violence that interests me, but the survival out of it because there's an opportunity for me as an artist to redefine what beauty means. And for me, beauty is the living despite violence. And in order to do that, one has to acknowledge the facts of where we've come from. Um, I think of, there's a sea foam, um, this sort of sea sponge. It's a beautiful creature to me. It's aesthetically quite hideous. But if you were to cut it up and you throw it into this bathtub, within a couple hours, it reattaches itself seamlessly. To me, that's what poetry and art can do. Um, and it does so for me by beginning to acknowledge that violence as part of ourselves, um, but also celebrating and trying to redefine what it means to move forward. Uh, despite the ugliness of our histories.